Franklin. Uh, thank you, Dr. Franklin. Um, we are delighted um, to be with you this morning. Uh, the subject that I'm going to talk to you about is um, pastor's burnout, the silent clergy killer. Uh, pastor's burnout, the silent clergy killer. Just like any of the caring professions, burnout is a real possibility in pastors and church leaders. I personally feel that it is outside the awareness of many of our pastors that this is taking place. But some statistics shows the 2013 study from the Schaffer's Institute reports that 1,700 pastors leave the ministry each month, citing depression, burnout, or being overwhelmed, overworked as their primary reason for leaving. Also, um, According to this study, 90% of pastors report working 55 to 70 hours a week, and 50% of them feel Can't hear you, Doc. Like he just went on mute. But he... Okay, go ahead, Pastor Simpson. Sorry, go can ahead. You, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, now, what part did you not hear? You just started to hear me? Just a few seconds. Yeah. Okay, well, let me go back. Uh, just like any of the caring professions, Burnout is a very real possibility in pastors and church leaders. I personally feel that it is outside the awareness of most of our pastors that this is taking place. But a study shows, 2013 study from the Shapers Institute reports that 1,700 pastors leave the ministry each month, citing depression, burnout, or being overwhelmed as their primary reason. Also, according to the study, 90% of pastors report working 55 to 70 hours a week, and 50% of them feel unable to meet the demands of the job. Many of our clergy, many of our pastors, uh, including the Reverend Sherry Perry and the Reverend Brian Webster, who is facilitating today as well, they are Bible, we are bivocational pastors, meaning that we spend 40 hours a week, most of us, 40 hours a week preparing sermons, teaching, Bible study, Sunday school, attending the needs of members, church planning, funerals, weddings, counseling, and then sometimes working 40 hours a week at a secular job. So this is another reason we are so susceptible to it because we feel that our job is to understand God and life and then explain it uh, to our people. Some of the uh, reason that I hear and Brian Dodd states that pastoring has one of the top three suicide rates of any profession. He admonishes congregational members for not supporting their faithful leaders. He claims that complaining 
often inconsiderate members increase the stress and expect too much of their passions. Here's some of the things that I, I've heard. We just can't do it anymore. We're so exhausted and we haven't had a break in a year. We feel swamped. There's always more to do than what we can imagine. The needs are so great, but we are burned out. We feel like failure and our health and families are suffering. We've been in the ministry for a long time. I'm on call around the clock. It's hard to say no to urgent needs. Leadership is a lonely place. Who can you go to? Who can you go to to say, I'm not coping well, or I need help? But let me look at some reasons for uh, burnout. Let me give you some reasons. Being on call 24 seven, every pastor, whether they're by vocational or not, they're still on call 24 seven. Criticism, poor conflict resolution, trying to please or trying to solve everyone's problems, not knowing how or being willing to delegate tasks. I'll say more about that later. Poor social skills, not equipped for all aspects of ministry. Limited social life outside the church. Well, what does burnout look like? I trust you're listening. Exhaustion, fatigue irritability, negativity, inadequacy, reduced empathy, reduced sense of gratification, reward or pleasure, reduced productivity, sense of overwhelm, being in despair, feeling isolated, feeling alone, feeling that no one knows what you're going through. Insomnia, relationship conflict, withdrawal and reduced intimacy. And let me say that this pandemic has caused even more isolation and more separation. Headaches, what do symptoms look like? Headaches, stomach aches, high blood pressure. What does symptoms look like? Mental health problems, anxiety, and oftentimes depression. Well, what can we do, pastors? clergy, what can we do? How can we prohibit it from happening to us? Here are some practical, let me just give you some practical tips before giving you uh, two Bible scriptures. Know your job. Have a job description. Clarify your new responsibilities. Have a leadership team that you can check in with regularly or quarterly meetings. Be sure and get self-help checks. Take care of yourself, ruling out medical, underlying medical conditions. Early detection is always the key. Seek social connections outside your church. Take leave at least twice a year with your family. Take time out 
for yourself, have a regular hobby or an annual retreat. Seek uh, peer mentoring. Have some mentor that you can seek support from. A book, regular debrief session. One of my uh, favorite books to read has been The Wounded Healer by Henry J. Nowen. This book simplifies the fact that yes, we too have been wounded. We too have been hurt. We too have been broken. But through Christ and through support and through our seeking the right channels, our wounds are healed and are being healed. And our helping others to be healed always helps us to, in our own healing. Exercise at least 30 minutes a day. The doctors here have said that if that was a pill that they could give us for high blood pressure, for dementia, for Alzheimer's, for my cholesterol, for cancer, for diabetes, that pill would be 30 minutes of exercising a day. And eat well and a balanced diet is well recommended portion to help you in your control. Now, let me show you again, this book by Henry J. Nowen. If you get an opportunity to read this book, to check it out, it will help you uh, tremendously in your own healing. That's two scriptures I want to give you, and then my time will be up. One of the things that I struggled with in the beginning of my own pastor, I've now pastored four churches and pastored in three states. And uh, the problem at the beginning was this. I did not know how to delegate. I thought I had to do it all alone. I tried to do it all alone. But when I look at the scripture, it teaches us two things. It teaches us about delegation, the importance about delegating. And look at Moses in Exodus, let me read a couple of verses for you. In Exodus, the 18th chapter, and most of you are familiar with Moses and his father-in-law, Jethro. And it came to pass on tomorrow that Moses, this is verse 13 of the 18th chapter, set to judge the people and stood before Moses from the morning until the evening. And when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did to the people, he said, what is this thing that thou doest to the people? Why sittest thou thyself alone? And all the people stand by thee from morning unto evening. And Moses said unto him, his father-in-law, because the people come unto me to inquire of God. When they have a matter, they come unto me. I judge one and another. I do make them know the statutes of God and his law. Moses' father-in-law said unto him, the thing that thou doest is not good. Thou wilt surely, don't miss this, thou wilt surely wear away both thou and this people that is with thee, for this thing is too heavy for thee, and thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Clergy, pastors, leaders, we cannot do it alone. We need support. We need to learn how to delegate. And 
Uh, lastly, um, but let me tell you what, what happened uh, in that uh, 24th verse. So Moses hearkened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he said. And Moses chose able men out of Israel and made them heads over the people. So it works. But the next thing that I want to close out with is uh, how can we combat uh, this clergy burnout? We must do pastoral care and self-care to ourselves. The Bible teaches us that. In Acts, the 20th chapter and the 28th verse, take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over thee, which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseer to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. The Bible commands us pastors, clergy, that we first take care of ourselves. Take heed to yourselves and then to the flock. Listen, my brothers and sisters, if I don't take care of myself, I'm not going to be able to take care of Sister Simpson, of my children, of Eighth Street Congregation, nor of the patients here at Vanderbilt Hospital. It all begins with self-care, my taking care of myself. And it, being, it, it begins with you taking care of you before you can take care of others. God bless you. Clergy, pastors, burnout is a silent killer, but we can prohibit it by following some guidelines. God bless you. Thank you for your time. Amen. Amen. Uh, you ready for us, Sister Perry? I am. I wasn't sure if you wanted to do your a Q and A for uh, Reverend Simpson, or just go on. We'll do that later. Yeah, we're gonna do that at the end. Okay. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Cordell. That was that was wonderful, and you really touched on the important. You, you named some things that I think, and I'm really pleased to hear this because. I think so often mental, mental health is a bad word in the church. Um, we don't want to talk about it. Uh, I was struck by a news report from 2019. So this is pre-pandemic as I was doing a little research on this myself. On September 10th, 2019, on World Suicide Prevention Day, news headlines broke about a famous pastor of a mega of a mega church and he was also an advocate for mental health and suicide prevention his name was jared wilson and he had died by suicide and that rattled um many christians many in in the world that knew of his ministry what happened how is this even possible that a pastor one that we look to you often as front line. When things go wrong, when we're walking through some of the worst things of our lives, tragedy, social injustices, death, grief, illness, who do we go to first often? Our pastors. And those of us on this call bear that mantle with a great heaviness at times. So what happened to this pastor? So there is a pastor, um, his name is Ed Seltzer, and he is a, he's a church planter. He was, he studied under Billy Graham and um, he's at Wheaton College. And so he wrote reflecting on this suicide. And so he writes, as many of us learned of Jared Wilson's suicide, I'm reminded that pastors and Christians are not immune and Reverend Cordell reminded us of that when he talked about burnout. And being honest 
about that is good for all of us, as Cordell also mentioned. Mental health matters. As much as we don't wanna talk about mental health matters, mental health matters. It matters greatly. That term mental health, when we discuss it and all the things that surround it, it's often hard for us to talk about it in the context of church life. Just saying that word most likely brings up thoughts and feelings about it. When we say our mental health, we often think that it's a special kind of brokenness. Maybe as a pastor, if we talk about having a mental health issue, we might feel like that's the end of our careers. And, and perhaps in some contexts, maybe some churches would. It would be a career ender for a pastor. Unfortunately, that does happen. But we are vocationally called to shepherd those in our care. And this puts high standards upon our shoulders, high expectations of ourselves, very high expectations of ourselves. So when we have those feelings of burnout, when we have feelings of stress, when we have those feelings of being overwhelmed or when our own grief, because we feel grief with those that we shepherd, let me just hit the pause button when I'm talking about this. What's the image of a shepherd? You know, we've studied this in our Bible texts when we read about when the 23rd Psalm rolls around, maybe you preach about it in your context that being a shepherd means you're walking with your sheep. They know your voice, they know your smell, and you're walking along, let's see, my uh, clinical pastoral education um, educator said, Sherry, get familiar with the term because you're gonna be walking in it a lot. And I'm probably, if I'm not doing this justice, forgive me for all of you theologically trained pastors out there, <laughs> scubala. And it is a Greek term for sheep poo. <laughs> So we walk in that, we walk in the muck, we walk in the sheep poo with our sheep. We, we walk in all of that with them. And it's easy for us to, to in, that, in that heart of compassion that we are extending, we take that on. Because being compassionate and kind and present also means we experience those things too. So we, we need to be more kind to ourselves. Some psychologists, one of my favorites, Susan, Susan David says, show up to your feelings with curiosity like you would people in your care. Be curious. Show up to your own emotional and psychological landscape like you would somebody coming to you in your care. Imagine yourself as this three-year-old or six-year-old, how kind and gentle you would be with them. That's how we need to care for ourselves, she says. Anyway, back to this. When feelings of burnout and stress and being overwhelmed and our own grief rise within us, so can shame, guilt, feelings of worthlessness, or of having failed, failed at our calling for God. I struggle with this myself. It's all or nothing. You're held up high. I don't know how many of you pastors, I, I came from a tradition that didn't ordain women. And so we talked a lot about spiritual authority. We talked about being living above reproach because Paul calls us out on that in, in, in the Timothy, it, the letters in Timothy, right? To Timothy, above reproach. Well, we latch onto that as having to live at this level of perfection that we can't be depressed. We can't possibly have mental illness because then that puts us well, that puts us at a, a level playing field with the people that we shepherd, doesn't it? And when I say that, that's the con condition of being a human being, a living, breathing human being with emotions, with families, with grief that we experience ourselves. And, and um, Reverend Webster will talk about that in a little bit. Um, all of those things that can make us feel damaged or broken. Not only that, but we put relationship boundaries around the congregations that we serve. Leadership, as Reverend Cordell alluded to, is a lonely place. I was taught you don't, you don't dump on your congregation. You don't talk to them about what's going on. That they're, it really rocks their world when you tell them you might be struggling um, with the grief of losing someone you love or with you're just so overwhelmed um, that it's hard for them to hear and be present with you because you're in a role of giving care. Um, 
So where do we turn? Where do we turn with those relationship boundaries that we place around them? After all, people look to us as the first, first, first line shepherds, um, shepherding through them uh, some of the hardest moments of their lives, like we talked about, and that image of a shepherd. We need to normalize asking for help, as Reverend Cordell alluded to with self-care. See, self-care, you know at Vanderbilt, we had on all of our screens at the nurse's station, self-care is not selfish. It's essential. So back to our pastor, Ed Setzer, who writes about this tragedy of the suicide. He writes, regrettably, one of the realities of, e of the evangelical community is our hesit hesitancy to look outside of our communities for help. But the truth be told, and these are, import that these are important resources outside of our community, some of those that Reverend Cordell mentioned. They're important resources that can help us as we deal with the growing issue of mental health. And I am so, so grateful and, and I'm, giving, I'm giving thanks to God in these conversations that we're having this morning that we actually named that baby mental health when, we, when I got on this call. I wasn't sure that where, where we all were with this, but this is wonderful that we're having this conversation. So Pastor Seltzer says, notably, it's important that we all, all of us know the number to the suicide prevention hotline. And I went out heavy with a suicide because if we don't care for ourselves, that's we could be the next headline. It could happen to any of us. See, the ministry has always been high profile. It's always been a high stress vocation. It's always been laden with near impossible expectations, one pastor writes. Actually, she's a psychologist. She says the bar is set often so high that pastors can't possibly succeed. And when pastors realize that they cannot live up to the demands imposed on them, not only by their communities that they serve, but Sometimes those highest expectations and hardest ones are the ones that we impose upon ourselves. They often turn their frustration back on themselves, kind of like it can be an all or nothing. Man, I'm, I have failed. I'm broken. I can't serve God anymore. So she's writing about this in her article about COVID-19 and suicide. So self-care is not selfish. Mental health matters matters. It's essential for avoiding burnout. And just like we need food and water and shelter for our physical well-being, and we get glasses so we can see with more clarity, we can also take steps bringing back into focus our, our mental well-being by giving ourselves permission and others permission to reach out for help and support and destigmatize mental health. It doesn't mean we're broken. It means that we're a human being. Mental health matters. Now we've, we've been through a whole lot these past two years with the pandemic, haven't we? Many of us are serving congregations that have, we've seen a decline in our offering plates. We've seen a decline in our pews. Maybe we were pressured to bring church back in the building knowing the risks that people would be encountering, gathering together. I, I worked on our COVID unit for the better part of this pandemic. And I saw my share of pastors behind the glass doors of one of our COVID rooms in ICU. I saw a loss of life. I saw a pastor with the virus go through 14 members of his family and he ultimately succumbed to it. And there was a lot of regret about feeling this pressure gathering. The one bit thing that we do in the church that comforts us, that's a source of emotional, spiritual, and yes, mental health support is being together, shaking a hand, putting our arms around one another, uh, a hug. Uh, our bodies from the times that we're babies, we are, are geared towards that human touch. So when we pray, we hold hands, you know, it, it, it's powerful. And all of those things were removed from us during this pandemic. So it can be very isolating. Not only that, but in the midst of all of this isolation, not being able to have church mere weeks before Easter in 2020 and having everything upended from there, we've seen um, 
political polarity on a scale that we probably haven't seen in decades. There are social issues now that have emerged that seems to have transported us back 50 years or more. Seems like we've taken a step backwards. And many pastors included find themselves struggling with depression. I heard a religious leader one time call it a legalized pout as she heaped shame upon those who needed a little help for depression. Um, truth is we can probably think of some biblical feather figures that struggle with a little bit of depression. One comes to mind, I need only read through the book of Psalms and some of the works of David in his music. You know, see as songwriters, I've written a few songs. We pour our hearts out into our poems. We can pour our hearts out into music. And he captures the human condition, the ups and the downs and the lows. And he names it, very, and here it is in the pages of our scripture these very human emotions. And yet God refers to David as a man after God's own heart. So I am so excited to sit here today with all of you and hear you name mental health and to hear you acknowledge that it is real and that we need to care for ourselves and one another. Wouldn't it be lovely if when you are hired into a church, your leadership team set you down and said, here, what we, we want you to um, get help for any mental health issues. You're in your family. And here's some resources maybe that we can point you to that might help you with that, that, that there was an acknowledgement of that, that you didn't feel the, the stigma being stigmatized or you didn't feel ashamed of having those feelings. Um, this is a great start. This conversation we're having right here today is a wonderful fabulous start. So I will end with those three things that, that Susan David talked about was approaching your feelings and yourself with kindness, acknowledging that your feelings are your feelings. It, it doesn't have to define who you are. It's part of this thing we call the human condition. Um, Self-care is not selfish, like Cordell said, that's the beginning point with that. And reaching outside of our communities with supporting one another, gatherings like this very one that we're on. We may not be able to fix those things, but sometimes when we're walking through things together, it's just good to feel seen and heard and that you are not alone. I will give you full self-disclosure. I have spent time in Cordell's office at work talking about work and talking about church. <laughs> and he has truly been a blessing. I've done the same with, with uh, Brian Webster too, who you'll hear about uh, following me in just a moment. So reach out to one another. That's a great resource. And be kind to yourself. Approach yourself like you would a child. Um, and be graceful as you would treat someone coming to you in your care. Know the number for mental health resources in your area. There are great um, therapists out there who also specialize in pastoral care. I will just tell a personal story. I have a 12-year-old granddaughter who's soon to turn 13 and going through all those emotions. And I was very glad when she stayed with us, we found ourselves with our grandchildren during the, the height of the lockdown, when everything locked down in March of 2020. I got COVID myself. Our grandkids went through lockdown with us. We couldn't send them home because of all the travel restrictions. But I found out that her mother very wisely has her talking to a therapist. And she said, Grandma, I have a therapist. And she started to hang her head like she was a little embarrassed about it. And she said, do you have a therapist? And I replied to her, why, yes. Doesn't everybody have a therapist? <laughs> and she sighed this sigh of relief. And I'm a, I hope that I normalized that for her. I talk to my therapist every other week. He's a, also a pastor. He's trained in clinical pastoral education so he can have the God talk with me if I need to. So there are resources out there. Um, yes, I do have a therapist. <laughs> um, he, is, uh, he has had um, a year of full residency. He's worked as a chaplain. So he's well, he talks, he talks uh, pastor language to me. He also actively preaches from time to time. 
So we go with the psychosocial, but we also pull out scripture. Um, he calls me out when I need to be called out and, and we just process those things. And he says, um, I struggle with those feelings of all or nothing. If I am not a perfect pastor, then I'm not worthy of God's call. And so I, I carry that with me. And so I know that at any given moment, I could be a headline. I have to recognize that if I don't care for myself, I could be a headline, just like, just like Pastor Jared Wilson was, this proponent of mental health and self-compassion and, and naming you know, mental health issues. As pastors, we don't have all the answers. If someone in our congregation comes to us, if we're kind to ourselves and we're doing these things for ourselves, we're gonna feel a lot more comfortable saying to those in our congregation, knowing when to refer. We can carry them so far and, you can, and we can refer them to somebody who can see them on a more regular basis. Um, if they have some clinical depression that needs to be treated, that's beyond our scope of, of practice. And then we can augment that and complement that. So it's, under, it's understanding that, but we have to under, understand ourselves and understand our own mental health first. You can't pour from an empty pitcher. That's an old self-care um, metaphor, which I think is lovely because I one of my favorite images of Jesus is the foot washing. And the image of that is a towel and a pitcher and a wash basin. And, and Jesus poured out from that water and he got down and he, and he cared for those. But Jesus also went away and took care of himself when he needed to. He retreated from people. You know, if you follow the lectionary, just a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about how people, the sermon, we hear about the Sermon on the Mount. A couple of weeks ago, we were talking about the Sermon on the Level Plain, where people could just come right up to Jesus and touch him. And the scripture even tells us about how he felt the power come out of him. They wanted the power, of the healing power of Jesus. They'd heard that he healed. But Jesus also spent time alone. He retreated from the crowds. He retreated from those he was shepherding and he communed with God and he cared for himself. So that's a great, that's a great model for all of us. So blessings on all of you in your ministry and blessings on each and every one of you as you engage this with honesty, compassion, and self-kindness as you grow in your practice of self-care. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Franklin. And uh, to my friends and colleagues, uh, Dr. Simpson and Pastor Perry, and to all of you who are gathered with us in this virtual space on today. It's good to be with you. It's good for us to uh, have this dialogue and uh, this discussion uh, about a much needed uh, topic of discussion uh, within our churches and within our homes. Uh, mental health, uh, fatigue, uh, self-care, and all of these things are, are not often talked about. Uh, but we were uh, blessed to be able to have um, a direct line to this kind of self-care as we engaged in uh, CPE, which is clinical pastoral education. And so uh, I thank uh, both of them for touching on uh, what I wanted to touch on, on today. So I'll just give you some statistics and um, a couple of thoughts and um, give you uh, some spiritual uh, reference at the end and then we can have uh, some dialogue and some discussion. Um, as it relates to uh, mental health, I think that all of us uh, do well uh, to uh, dig into this subject matter of mental health because the reality of it is, is that the uh, statistics uh, related to um, clergy and mental health are quite alarming. Um, it is said that nearly one fourth of all pastors acknowledge having uh, personally suffered uh, with some form of mental illness. And uh, half of those pastors say that 
their mental illness was diagnosed. And the number of pastors diagnosed with clinical, um, uh, di clinical depression is double the rate of the national, uh, the national average. I'm gonna give you a couple of more statistics. 70% uh, of pastors deal or battle with depression. 80% of pastors uh, at some point or another have felt or dealt with discouragement. 90% of pastors' families, hear me now, 94% of pastors' families feel the pressure of ministry. 78% of pastors have no close friends. 97% of pastors have uh, felt like they've been betrayed, felt like they've been falsely accused, and felt the hurt uh, from trusted friends. That's why a lot of pastors don't have uh, close friends. A lot of pastors suffer in isolation and seclusion to themselves, um, and that shouldn't be. Um, mental health is a state of well-being in which individuals realize uh, his or her own ability and can cope with the normal stress of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to his or her community as it relates to pastors and uh, make a contribution to your congregation, congreg your um, spiritual um, body of Christ in which you serve. According to the World Health Organization, mental health includes subjective well being, perceived self efficiency, autonomy, competency, intergenerational dependence, and self actualization of one's intellectual and emotional potential. Uh, mental health has to do with our intellectual and our emotional potential. For, uh, from the perspective of positive psychology or holism, mental health may include the individual's ability to enjoy life, to create a balance between life activities and effectiveness, life activities, and efforts to enjoy um, psychological resilience. This is uh, an alarming statistic. And we've talked about, Sherry Perry talked about pastors who have committed suicide. And I wanna suggest that uh, mental health plays a role or a key role in those pastors who have uh, taking their own lives. Mental health has to do with sleep irritation, has to do with us having a lack of energy and thinking of harming ourselves or harming others. There uh, was Pastor John Gibson in 2015 committed suicide. There was a church pastor in Arizona in 2013 who committed suicide. The mega church pastor uh, during Patrick in 2020 committed suicide. There was also a prominent well-known pastor in Zimbabwe in 2019. Uh, he came in and encountered a situation between his wife and someone else. Walked to the fourth floor of a rooftop of a garage and committed suicide. And then there's also uh, Teddy Parker, who pastored the church in Macon, Georgia, committed suicide. Suicide is something that 
uh, suicide and mental health is something that ought to be dear to the hearts of the people of God. Because uh, as we endeavor to be spiritual and emotional support systems and advisors to those who we pastor, their spiritual well-being has to be, and their wholeness has to be at the forefront of our mind. As Cordell would say, it cannot uh, be outside of our awareness. It has to be at the forefront of our awareness. As uh, we look at the spiritual condition, uh, the spirituality or spiritualness that we might, we must look at our spiritual well-being. Uh, what does or uh, what do pastors think about as it relates to themselves and their spiritual well-being? Um, Twenty-one percent of in a study. Um, by the Barner Group, 21% of pastors say that as it relates to their spiritual well-being at the moment, they're doing excellent. 52% uh, of them say that, uh, that they're doing good. 22% say that they're average in their spiritual well-being. But 4% of those who were taken in the study suggest that their spiritual well-being is well below the average. So at 4% being well below the average, that means that there is an alarming rate of possibility of those pastors suffering from spiritual depression or at a worse point from mental illness. The number of pastors, the number of pastors uh, diagnosed, there's a number of pastors diagnosed with clinical depression. And that number is double the national average. So the national average of everyone else who's been diagnosed from clinical depression, pastors double that rate. 45% sought advice from the family doctors regarding stress and anxiety. So that tells us that stress and anxiety has a great deal to do with their clinical depression. Pastors uh, exceed in their own, on their own and in their congregation, demands to perform. Neglecting time for self-care and their own faith maturity. Many pastors have never gone to a preaching conference to nurture and to sow in to their own selves and to their own lives. And so they can be fed just like others have to be fed. We have to have a time that we can move and break away from us pouring out and sowing into everyone else periodically and take time to sow into our own selves and so we can be sowed into. And um, on average, pastors surveyed are working as, as Cordell was saying, 50 hours plus a week. And some work 55 hours a week. That's just those who are not by vocation because the reality of it is, is uh, Pastor Simpson and Pastor Perry and myself, we probably double that or sometimes maybe even triple that. And so we're overworked. <laughs> and every now and then, we need a reprieve to get some rest. Nearly 40% of pastors never take, 40% of pastors take fewer than three days off a month. Fewer than three days off a month. Many ministers, many pastors, they neglect regular exercise. They neglect personal devotion. They neglect relaxation. All in the, in the, in the, in the, in the name of finding more time 
to do more by way of service. Hear me now. You neglect exercise. You neglect personal devotion. And you neglect relaxation in order to find more times for service in ministry. 94% of pastors said that they read scripture. Hear me now. 94% of pastors say uh, that although they read scripture and prepare for sermons, they rarely nourish themselves personally. That's sad. But when we look at these alarming statistics and these different studies by different groups as it relates to mental health, as it relates to fatigue, self-care, and mental illness, uh, we find that uh, self-care must be at the forefront of our not allowing ourselves to be subject matter to burnout and uh, to fatigue. And so I just wanted to give you a little more context behind what Sister Perry talked, Pastor Perry talked about, because it's important for us to look at this information, to look at these statistics, and these statistics ought to move us to action and move us to doing something about it. I want to uh, give you some other statistics behind this thought. Fatigue or compassion fatigue can lead us to burnout. But the remedy for us is self-care. Fatigue or compassion fatigue can lead us to burnout. But the remedy for us is self-care. In uh, the clinical pastoral realm, we use this term, um, compassion fatigue. Compassion fatigue is uh, a, 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 um, a term used to describe those who have got to a level of fatigue or a level of burnout because they spent so much time pouring and sowing into everyone else that they then begin to have this fatigue that keeps them from being able to sow into everyone else. Compassion fatigue is a condition characterized by emotional and physical exhaustion. It leads to the diminished ability to empathize or feel compassion to poor others often described as the negative cost of caring. I want to suggest that this passion for tea has affected many who operate in the realm of pastoral ministry, who operate in the realm of providing spiritual and emotional support and care for others to the point where you become in need of spiritual care yourself. It is uh, what some would call a second a secondary traumatic stress, meaning that because of the stress of you sowing emotionally and spiritually into everybody else, you may reach a point where you become traumatically stressed yourself. Compassion fatigue is an overwhelming mental and physical exhaustion brought on by feeling the pain and other uh, pain of other emotions of people that are, you are helping. The mere empathetic and open, the more empathetic and open they are to the suffering of others, the more likely they are to feel that suffering themselves. As a pastor and as a caregiver and as a spiritual and emotional provider, the more you open yourself up to the emotional stresses of everybody else, 
then the more you open yourself up for the ability to suffer from emotional fatigue. What is compassionate fatigue? What are some of the characteristics? And then I'm almost out of here. Uh, irritability, anxiety, agitation, frustration, and anger. I know a whole lot of pastors who've been irritable, who have suffered some, for some anxiety, who have felt a whole lot of frustrations, and from time to time have felt some anger. Um, it is depersonalization and feeling disconnected from others. I believe this is one of the reasons why many pastors don't have the emotional support system of a whole lot of friends and close confidants because there is a feeling of depersonalization and a sense of disconnect from others. That could be the case. It is a decreased feeling of empathy and sympathy for people. Increased chronic psychological and emotional fatigue, apathy, uh, disinterest, dread related to work, working for or taking care of others. Many pastors who have walked away from the field of pastoral ministry do so because they have lacked an interest for taking care of others because they have spent themselves out emotionally, mentally, physically to the point of exhaustion and feeling as though they can no longer do it. What then do we do? By learning and adapting to regular self-care practices as a part of our routine each day, pastors and caregivers can address compassion fatigue before it sets in, allowing ourselves to reduce and even eliminate it altogether. <coughs> Pastoral care for those we provide spiritual care for. <clears throat> what can we do? We can develop a solid, holistic care regimen and caring and carving out daily for ourselves and weekly a schedule in which we complete that routine and can work, uh, and work it can work wonders for those of us who are willing to work as care professionals and pastors of congregations. The question then becomes, what then can I do to prevent compassion fatigue? Well, I'm glad you asked. Well, first of all, you can engage in regular exercise, maintain uh, a nutritious diet, get increased rest and sleep, take time off from work or time off from doing ministry and refrain from checking work calls, from checking cell phone emails and messages and spend some time alone and in the presence of God. Undergo therapy with a mental health professional can help us to avoid compassion fatigue. We join a support group, get you a support group, get you a circle of folk who will support you and can support you through what you're going through. You have to learn how to support, how you have to learn how to set some emotional boundaries for yourself. You can even practice mindfulness or meditation. And if you're a little bit flexible, you might even want to do some yoga. Compassion fatigue can lead us to a point of burnout. But the remedy for us is self-care. Jesus himself practiced self-care. So we to ourselves, if we're gonna be holistic, if we're gonna be good practitioners in our spiritual care and in our pastoral assignments, we've got to learn to do like Jesus did and do some self-care. I'll give you two scriptures and you can read them in your own time. Matthew 14 chapter, verses 18 through 23. Jesus fed the 5,000 
And after he fed the 5,000, he went up into the mountain to retreat, to do some self-care, and to spend some time with God. Luke chapter 6, verses 12 and verse 13. You'll find these words. During those days, he went out to the mountain to pray, and to spend, he spent all night in prayer with God. And when, day came, day, when daylight came, he summoned his disciples, and he chose 12 of them. He also named them apostles. If we're going to continue to do ministry, we've got to maintain good mental health. We've got to make sure that we do not become sufferers of fatigue or compassion fatigue. We also must do self-care as Jesus did. The Lord bless you and keep you is my prayer. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to have a Q&A. You can uh, ask uh, our presenters uh, a question. Uh, let me just start. Uh, because this was especially challenging for me. Uh, Reverend Perry, I seem to have heard you saying that sometimes we struggle with our humanity. Without, am I correct? We, as leaders, sometimes, we, if we're not careful, we will put expectations on ourselves that, are, that can be a burden rather than accepting our own humanity when it comes to those things. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, it, we're subject to all the things that those that, that we shepherd, all of those folks. We're, we're in this together. We're accompanying them. And we're just as human as anybody that we serve, but, but we, can, we can place ourselves on such a high, um, am I off mute somewhat? <laughs> we can place ourselves on such a high, um, level of expectation that I think we forget our own humanness and um, we can be particularly hard on ourselves. Okay, let me just follow up and I'll back off. That's, that's, I don't know if it was you or Cordell or Brother Weft who mentioned that sometimes we have fears that our congregants uh, will have problems with us if they know we have the same struggles that they have and that that can put more pressure on us. Did I hear that correctly? Yes, yes. I, I, I did name that when I, when, I was, when I was speaking, yeah. What causes that fear? Uh, within ourselves? Yes. Well, um, well, let me ask you, what, what do you think um, causes that fear? Do you think it's th there's these expectations that we're supposed to be the providers of care? Um, they are looking to us to guide them. And so perhaps I wonder if there's this expectation that we are immune to that somehow. Yeah. It, it ends up, is, it, is it possible that that fear comes from the folks that we serve knowing how we're just as humanly vulnerable as any of them? Uh-huh. What do you think? I, I uh, sometimes I think we, we probably put it on ourselves. Just listening to someone, I, it may have been Cordia talking about uh, delegating, mm -hmm. that sometimes if we're not careful, uh, we'll be, uh, what's the word I want? We will, we will be victim to our own fame and we'll try to be Superman mm -hmm. without a cape. Yeah. And when they find out we can't fly <laughs> without a cape, <laughs> and, and how we might be perceived if we delegate. And so we find ourselves running here and there and everywhere trying to do things that are just unacceptable. But that seems, I just seem to hear throughout, throughout all these presentations, this, this whole thing about your own humanity, coming to grip with your own humanity and, and uh, understanding it and being able to live with it. I mean, I thought that was a great challenge. Huh? 
Thank you. I'm, I'll back out some more questions. Thank you. Thank you. And, and Pastor Franklin and group, if I may say something about yes, that. Yes, sir. Uh, that was why I talked about uh, the book on Wounded Healer, uh, recognizing that we too have been wounded. We have oftentimes lifelike problems. And if of what I'm telling you, if I don't believe that it will heal me, I in the world can I convince you that the same thing I'm telling you can heal you. I've got to believe it first. And um, um, all of us have, have been wounded and broken oh, and oh, bruised. Oh, oh. Yeah. yeah, thank you. And who is that? Pastor Webster. Okay. I was, I was looking at some quotes and uh, one of the quotes, and I can't remember who said it, but he said that uh, just because I'm alone doesn't mean that I'm broken. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Meaning that, you know, all of us have to take some time out to be, a, to, be in a, to be in a space alone so we can spend some time with God. But just mm -hmm. because I, I, I remove and seclude myself from people, it doesn't mean that I'm broken or that I'm not necessarily part of the group. It just means that, you know, I know that I need some refreshment from time to time. And I think yeah. that Dr. Franklin, you and uh, Sister Perry were both correct and that there are times when um, um, we uh, endeavor not to be vulnerable amongst our congregation. And we put that lack of vulnerability on ourselves. But in the same token, there are also times when our congregation place upon us an ability for us to not be vulnerable because they don't want to see our vulnerability because to them, that vulnerability is a sign of weakness. Mm -hmm. But in the clinical pastoral education, they, they teach you, or they teach us the importance of acknowledging and knowing our own vulnerabilities and not being afraid to share those vulnerabilities and that us sharing those vulnerabilities is not a sign of weakness. Now I digress. <laughs> Right. Question. Uh, I have a question and a comment. I'll do my comment first. I appreciate all the presenters today because this is really prevalent for today's time because I know me personally, I've experienced within the past 2022, uh, two pastors that have passed because they didn't have that need. They felt they had a uh, lack of self-care. I know one pastor he preached in front of his congregation, what, Sunday morning? And that Sunday afternoon, he passed. And he had worked in the funeral business, and he said the night before, he had did over five or six bodies because he was an undertaker. And another pastor preached that Sunday morning, next day passed. My question is, um, out of all the presentations, one word came to mind, which was arrogance. How does arrogance play a part? of the mental health and the self-care. <laughs> That's to anybody. I'll speak a little bit to this and I when when you when we say the word arrogance, I I I ponder does that mean um arrogance as in I, I want to be strong yeah and by admitting some vulnerability then I am not uh -huh. and and that makes me feel arrogant that I I'm not able or I, I don't feel safe maybe maybe one doesn't feel safe to express a vulnerability because when you express a vulnerability there's always opens that up for um, a, a 
tenderness that can be poked at or it, oh. it can hurt. And um, I, I know one of the things that I've shared with, you know, as a, as a new pastor, a, a Cordell has seen me several years in with some, uh, some issues with my own congregation, a small rural church where the pastor can also can be very scapegoated for a lot of things because there's this um, tendency to not recognize a pastor's vulnerability with themselves and family because they feel they've got to be superhuman, you know, a little bit, you know, you put them up here, they're, they're leading, they're not supposed to be vulnerable. Um, they can be really hard because they don't see us as uh, living, I don't say living, breathing, but, but human beings that, that suffer death and suffer illness and have our children, we go through things with our kids and, and, uh, and we live this human existence right alongside them. So um, yeah, that, that I guess being able to express that can make the, can make us go to the opposite of that and feeling arrogant that we maybe struggle with doing that or have a hard time doing that. Is that kind of what I'm hearing? Yes. And then you touched on it in your presentation when you said, you know, a lot of, uh, the fellow members uh, feel that we're above uh, a high approach mm-hmm. and everything with high esteem. And mm-hmm. we feel like we're just Superman and think they mm-hmm. can't nobody hit us or anything like that. We don't need rest. We just need like a five minute break if we can go back. <laughs> it's just like that. Yeah. So yeah, you hit, it, you hit it directly. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us and being no vulnerable. <laughs> and uh, bro. Uh, Team, uh, I think that uh, it's a possibility that this could happen to to any of us. Uh, In Galatians, the sixth chapter and verse one, uh, Paul gives us a warning. He said, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So I think that this is something that can happen to any of us when we uh, allow ourselves to be uh, led away uh, from the word. Uh, He also warned us uh, that uh, in that fourth verse, that third verse, he said, "For, for if a man thinketh himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceived himself. So mm. you can fool yourself uh, to thinking that you're more than what you are. And mm. listen, think about it. Uh, you're over people. You're the pastor. You're the leader. And uh, you have the responsibility of caring for all of these individuals. Uh, if you're not careful, as they say in Africa, that that could give you the fat head. <laughs> so, so it's up to, again, to that pastor, uh, for the pastor, he or she, uh, to do pastoral care and self-care to themselves and not deceive themselves. The individuals who get to that place has deceived themselves. Do you think, oh. Cordell, sometimes it can lead a pastor? You almost have your church face. <laughs> and then on, on Monday morning, maybe you feel a sense of being deflated a little bit. Or, you know, you, you, you always have to keep that church face on. Um, I don't know. What do you think about that? I think that, as it was pointed out in um, some of the statistics that I that I've lifted, is that not only can you have your church face on on Sunday and another face on on Monday, but sometimes uh, you can be wearing two faces on Sunday <laughs> because if 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 if, if if you're reading and you're studying the word, 
or not, well, I ain't going to say studying, but if uh, you're reading the word and you're uh, compiling a sermon and uh, that sermon does not do anything for you and you just put it together for the people, then you weren't <laughs> Yeah. I was always taught in coming in that, you know, when you prepare and create a sermon, that sermon, first of all, has to meet at your need before it meets at the need of somebody else. And if it doesn't yeah. happen, then you want two faces. <laughs> so I'll, I'll say it for Dr. Franklin question. <laughs> So if we if we uh, just take off the titles and you know take away the word pastor and the same that is true of uh, of us is true of every individual in when it comes to self care when it comes to um, honesty with yourself and I think I think somebody mentioned in their presentation meeting yourself now that can be a dangerous thing. <laughs> meeting yourself so even when we take away everything else the, the, the needs that i have you know the lord is my shepherd but he's your shepherd and your shepherd and he's your shepherd too so the same needs that i have uh, are the same needs that the individual has that i'm meeting with and i think that's where that's where sometimes if we're not careful we might put ourselves a little bit too high Mm -hmm. And then we have to fall a little further in our own defeats, frustrations, or whatever, whatever we're doing. And, and if I heard you right, it's okay for me. It's okay for me to accept my struggle, my humanity, because I am a human being. And that does not take away from what, what God has called me to do or what, or what station I am in life. I'm always struck by the disciples after walking with Jesus all that time. Every year when we come around this time of year with Easter, after all they walk through with them on that road to Jerusalem, mm -hmm. man, they still had a lot of feelings. They still hid in that room and they, and they ran away and they, and they, and they, they were very human. Yeah. But through the power of Christ and through the power of Christ's spirit, they were used in amazing ways. So that helps give me a little connection. Before they were on stained glass, they messed up a whole lot. And they struggled with this condition of humanity just like us. <laughs> yes. Yes. I think, Dr. Franklin, uh, you're exactly right. And... Um, as I encounter uh, those who are in the clinical uh, pastoral field who are experiencing uh, deep emotional experiences of grief and loss uh, compounded by everyday life, uh, just as well as we're reminding ourselves about the need for self-care. Uh, as you said, let's take the title pastor off. Uh, and say that we all uh, have a need for self-care. Oh, and God. as spiritual and emotional providers, we have a responsibility to those who do not hold a title to encourage them to promote self-care as well. Because we want not only pastors, uh, lay leaders, and, and leaders in the church to be emotionally, oh, spiritually God. whole. Oh, we want to promote a sense of wholeness within all of the body of Christ. And so if we neglect to tell our parishioners and those who we encounter to promote self-care and give them the essential tools for self-care, then we do a disservice to ourselves and to the body. So the absence of self-care leads to mental health problems. Yes, I think so. Okay. Thank you. That's why I've been trying to get to the absence of self-care. Yeah. Big word, big umbrella, but I got you. Thank you for that. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. 
Okay. No other question? They don't mind. Hello. Hey, yes. Pastor. I have a question yes. and just a, a reflection. Uh, I think one of the things that comes into about being mindful and self-care and to answer some of the questions is that when we do become mindful and to start to monitor our self-care and to not be in denial about the fact that when I am struggling, I think that makes us mindfully aware that I am human. And if we start to take time to actually evaluate ourselves, then I think we'll get away from the fact, being in denial of the fact that because I am a pastor, that I suffer just like anybody else. So that's, that's the way of self-care when we become mindful to monitor our self-care by examining ourselves and being honest with ourselves. I think that's, that's beneficial to us. And so when we are unwilling to do that, I think that's when we kind of maybe get into level, I think where Jerome had asked the question about being so arrogant to say that I don't have problems. I don't uh, go through things that everyone else goes. And I think that helps us become mindful in our self-care practice. And so that's my comment to some of the questions and some of the things that I have heard, because we have to be mindful of our care. And so when we're willing to admit that, then I think that progresses us versus taking us backwards or leaving into us a pit. And so that's my thoughts on that. And if anybody like to add to that, uh, I'm open to that. Okay, thank you. Hello. Yes. Yes. I have a question. What if you realize that you're right in the middle of the woundedness? What would be my first step back to wholeness because of church issues and uh, things like that? So what would be my first line of action to help myself if I, if I admit that I am right there being wounded? I would Is that say, an open question to anyone? Okay. I would say accepting the reality of your hurt, recognizing that you are hurt, you are being hurt, mm -hmm. accepting the reality of your being hurt. This is real. I'm hurting. And then seeking help. And your pastor could guide you through that. Hmm. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Any other question? I, I guess I just want to ask the person that just posed that question on the phone, are you serving currently as a pastor? Okay. I, I am an assistant pastor. But no, I am not currently serving as the pastor. So you are trying to figure out what should you do when you when you admit to yourself that this situation is hurting me? Yes. Sister Perry, didn't you give an illustration of what it was to be a sheep watcher as you go along following sheep? Certain things will get on you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I did. Um, okay. I, I, I guess I would, I would suggest. Do you have someone outside of your community, if you're feeling the woundedness coming from within your community, those that you serve, or maybe those that are on staff with you, is there someone outside of your community at maybe a different level within your tra faith tradition, or do you have um, a pastoral counselor that you can reach out to or a colleague in ministry that maybe has walked through this with you uh, or something similar? Um, not at this time. I ha I have sought help from professionals, but I was limited in what I felt like sharing with them because I never want to give anyone the 
impression that um, faith is not important and that I don't have faith with God. And I'm not, my problem is not with God. It's, it's with some of his people or some of his so-called people. But I don't, I'm, my problem is that I need to distance myself from some of the feelings I've got my own self. In, in order to help yourself, you got to first admit that you have, have a problem. So I'm admitting that I need to change my thinking on some of the things too. Well, I want to affirm that you have reached out to someone and you're talking to someone. So I just, I just want to bless that action and that you, you felt safe enough to share that with everybody here. So thank you for that. Thank you all for being so uh, understanding and able to listen. And I have thoroughly enjoyed everything from start to finish. In fact, I've written notes throughout the whole session, and it is very much needed and very much appreciated. Thank you all. Let me let me ask you. Let me just ask the group, and if if it's no uh, if it's nothing that we cover. You know, sometimes in a situation where you find yourself constantly bleeding from it, is it a no-no to consider stepping away from that situation? From Franklin, when you say stepping away from that situation, uh, yeah. what do you yeah. mean? I mean, getting yourself out of that environment. If it's not, if it's not potential for your growth there uh, to... Uh, to work out your your faith in another place or at some other place some other time rather than to stay there and bleed to death is it is it healthy to do that or or are we to just stay there and lie there and die there like Mona Lisa's dreams <laughs> uh, I, I would think just off the top of my head it depends on the situation of course whether um, whether you're talking about a pastor who is struggling to the point of uh, ineffectiveness and, and hurting the congregation or a, a church member uh, moving their membership to another, uh, to another church, uh, depending on the situation, uh, I would hope that that person, and I, and I guess to answer your question, uh, I think it depends on the situation and the and that person needs to be open to changing their environment, whether a leadership position or a church. I would think it's okay. However, uh, within different contexts, within different environments, it's not okay. Uh, I've seen pastors struggle with debilitating uh, issues and still be a pastor and for their ministry to go downhill because uh, because it wasn't okay to go to the official board or the, the board of deacons and say, look, I'm struggling, I need to take a break, or it's time for me to move on, or whatever the situation uh, calls for. So in a lot of contexts, it's not okay. Uh, however, I would think and hope and pray um, that it would be okay for that person's sake and for the sheep's sake, for the sake of that that congregation. Yeah. Well, Pastor and group, um, I'd like to refer us to the proverbial writer, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. I, I hear a lot of personal pronouns, I think, what's best for me um, but in all thy ways acknowledge him he will direct thy path you don't want to leave and go nowhere if you are a child of God unless God speaks to you he may have you there to take that weapon you may need that weapon <laughs> I'm just saying <laughs> I, I feel you on that. <laughs> but, but Pastor, I think that you, you're extremely right because 
I've seen pastors, <clears throat> excuse me, I've seen pastors who uh, were in a pastoral position and struggled with some difficulties in the congregation and simply left that congregation and they've struggled ever since because they didn't get fired by God, they quit. And for you to prematurely leave an assignment without God's release, that's detrimental to you. And that's something that you definitely don't want to do. Uh, and that's the same thing that Cordell was saying, because we got to lean out to our own understanding because in that storm or whatever you're going through, uh, regardless of how bad it is, there's something in it that God has in store for you. And when you think about the story of Jabez, and Jabez asked God to enlarge his territory. But he knew with the enlargement of territory, there were going to be some difficulties and problems to come along with it. So what did he ask? He asked God, he said, just keep your hand on me that you can keep all evil away from me. And as long as God keep his hand on you and whatever you're going through, God will see you through it. But you can't quit. You can't walk away unless God really release you. And that's my thoughts. And Brother Pastor, would you think, would you say that that is also applicable not only for pastors, but for any child of God? Yes, Wherever sir. you are, God directs your path. And God has you there for his plan and his purpose. And then you hop up and leave. Well, that's on you. <laughs> they, you they right call that Patmos Island. <laughs> And I think about the disciples, when, when he went up on the mountain, he put them on a boat and sent them out to some trouble. And he sent them out to some trouble that they could not get out of uh, until he released them. <laughs> so yeah, you're right. Yeah. Uh, interesting. Any other questions? Any other questions? Any other questions? I just have one more question. Yes. How does one find a licensed uh, therapist that's right for them? We get asked a lot of times to uh, recommend or maybe refer um, a therapist or a counselor. There's so many out there, but how does one find one that's right for them? Uh, and I say that because sometimes people go and they find a, a therapist or a counselor and they may not be the right one they poured their heart out, they told their story to find that that's not the one for them. And then they have to go and repeat the story to someone else. Well, when you say that you have, you refer out, do you keep a list of, I think it depends on what's available to you. Sometimes, folks in their place of employment have like an EAP and that can get you started. You get like a couple free, but I hear what you're saying with it where you're pouring your heart out and you're telling the story and you're trying to get matched with the right ones. Um, I think there are some resources out there that will kind of help guide you and what they specialize in. Like if do they specialize in the adolescent certain types of traumas or certain types of things. I know when I was looking for mine, I know that I'm gonna process a lot differently um, as a pastor and as a chaplain, I almost speak a different language. So I, it was real important for me to find someone that I could speak that language with because I, I felt those feelings trying to go to a regular therapist that didn't understand the vocation of ministry um, and that I didn't feel like I could have the God talk with as well. So, um, you know, maybe a little, uh, I, I think some websites and some of when you're looking at practices, they ask the questions before you go. Um, so thank you for keeping a, li a list and, and referring folks. Hello, can you hear me? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, what I do a lot of times in, in my practice is, especially uh, being a Christian and a child of God, there's so many out there that, you, that will say specifically when you're doing the internet search, they'll say faith-based counselor. So if we're going to seek therapy and counsel, we want to have someone that uh, 
has the same faith and belief that we do because it comes from a different perspective then than just a carnal uh, counselor, if I could use that word. So uh, that's one of the ways that I do, especially in having conversations with individuals, uh, especially if you're talking about counseling and you're a child of God, you want to have somebody who believes and professes the same as you do because they understand the, the call and the necessity uh, for God in counseling and prayer and all that. So that's important. So that's just another suggestion for me uh, when I make referrals out. Oh, Shavelle, was that you answering that question? Ask yes, that sir. Question. Yes, sir. And I, do, and I do keep a list. We do um, have a list that we refer out, but I have yeah. had people to respond back that that maybe wasn't the counselor for them. So I give them another name. I usually give them two or three names at the same time and, yeah. hope, and ask them to, to pray about it um, before they make that call. And um, as Miss Perry said, to um, make a list of questions that you have beforehand. And I advise them to do their research because I don't always know the counselors personally. Yeah, uh, Chevelle and her husband Earl are over our grief ministry at the church. And uh, they come in contact with a lot of people during our grief sessions. And um, I think specifically, that may be the, the role that they're trying to, you know, we try to come up with these list of people <laughs> and uh, sometimes we don't get the response we think we should so i know so dealing with grief is that way is that a particular type of uh counselor out there for grief that you might be able to suggest or just follow that same procedure Hospice companies are, have, uh, many of them have great grief counseling resources. I know in Middle Tennessee Alive, hospice does a wonderful job with their grief counseling. And then as part of hospice, they usually incorporate chaplains. So, yeah. Okay. All right, thank you, thank you. Any other questions? All right, uh, no other questions. Uh, I thank you for, for these great presentations. I tried to give you a thumbs up using my computer here, but that didn't come out. Uh, didn't come out right, I'm hitting all these buttons here. And uh, I'm thanking my, my personal friend, Cordell uh, Simpson, been knowing him for, for a while. Knew him in Alabama, pastored in Alabama together some years ago. <laughs> and uh, I put the weight on putting this together on his shoulders. And I sure do appreciate you for all you did, man, for to make this happen. And I'm quite sure that anybody who listened today was moved and, and, uh, and motivated uh, to just try to be the best person you can. And to thine own self be true and others you will not deceive. You know, if you're trying to be true uh, to yourself, so let's take our hand. Uh, let's take our mics off of mute. Everybody, out. let's give them a big hand. Let me see, can I hear you? And if I can hear you, get them a big hand. Will that come through? Amen. So, Cordell, uh, Sister Terry, Amen. Uh, thank you. And uh, I wrote down all kind of questions here uh, to that will help us develop some other ministries. And uh, it's always good to make new friends, always good. And uh, we will be meeting, we will be uh, talking again. Uh, the person who was running the, uh, making sure that the um, Zoom was working is Paul McLeod. Raise your hand right there, Paul. Paul is our Christian ed man. And um, he's, either, he's either in the office or he got a map on the wall at home. Make me think he is. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's in the office, but I'm at home uh, doing this. And uh, to all of you, to God be the glory. Yes. Any of you like to say anything? Yes, sir. Cordell, do you have your hand up? No, no. Okay. Anybody like to say anything before we dismiss? We appreciate you. All of you. Great job. Amen. I want to pray a blessing Amen. over. I just want to say a blessing over everyone. Um, 
and this amazing work that you do and may God bless you and keep you and, and hold you and, and just lift you up and carry you when you need it. And I always say a little prayer to God on a daily basis. Lord, put your arm around me and encourage me. And when necessary, put your hand over my mouth. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> good one. Good one. <laughs> good, good. But well, Webster, appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dr. You, may, appreciate you may have another meeting with some of your officers today on Saturday, but I appreciate you sacrificing your time, all of you. And uh, you'll be hearing from me real soon. And we're just praying God's blessing upon all of you. Yes. Now, uh, Cordell, I'm going to delegate uh, this to you. And you can uh, uh, put this on one of your uh, presenters to dismiss us in prayer. Which one are you going to delegate to? <laughs> <laughs> Now say that again, real pastor. Uh, I'm going to ask one of your presenters to dismiss us, and I want you to delegate that to one of them. Oh, uh, <laughs> Sister Reverend Sherry Perry just gave a prayer, so that Reverend Bryant. So, okay. Let us let's bow for a word of prayer. Gracious God, we are so thankful and grateful for this opportunity that we might come together on this Saturday morning to dig into vital and essential information to kingdom building. And we pray that what it was said will be embedded in our hearts and our minds that we might use it for our need to edify and to lift up the body of Christ. We pray your blessings over Dr. Franklin and all of these who are gathered together with us on today. Oh God, continue to bless and keep us, continue to anoint us afresh, continue to keep your hand upon us and continue yeah. oh God, to keep evil away from us that we might do what you called us to do in a manner acceptable in your sight, that you might get the glory. And so yeah. we thank you for all of the many blessings that you've given us in days that have come and gone, how you're blessing us even right now, but most of all, oh God, the blessings that you're going to give us in the days to come. In yeah. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you again. Thank you. The Lord look up his countenance upon you and be gracious to you and yeah. give you peace. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Bless y'all. Thank you. All righty. Be safe. Thank you.